You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. This podcast is we for anyone who's battling with addictions, been in and out of prison, been abused. For you as a kid who was abused when you were younger, heroin addict, alcoholic, done for armed robbery, attempt murder, seen your mum and dad fighting. You've been through turmoil in your life, you've been through misery, you've been through pain, but you've came out the other end of it. You know, I got I got into crime quite young and, you know, my first offence was uh, armed robbery and possession of firearms. I was age 15 and, um, you know, back then it, was, it, it wasn't it was that heard of, like a 15-year-old armed robber. Um, and, and, and really looking back, it, it was my desire to protect the scared little boy. You know, if I could be the toughest, the loudest criminal, it would mean that no one could hurt me. I believe I had to make a decision. I don't believe you can be on both sides of the fence. You've either got to be on the side where you're building people up or you're tearing people down. You can't be both. A group of rugby fans got racially abusive to my friend and you know a fight broke out and and it just went too far you know the guy who racially abused my mate got stabbed in the throat the face and the throat like multiple times um and that was it i remember waking up to a pillow over my head did that kill you yeah a pillow over my head while the other two were just like battering me really you know it's funny i was i was so desperate to end it james I was so, like, to the point I was like, I cannot bear this, this cold turkey any longer. And as soon as I, the rope tightened around my neck, as, like, instantly, I didn't want to die. But I'd realised that it was too late. I couldn't get it off. And it, you go from trying to pull it off to then realising it's too late. To then thinking about your family and your mum, and your brothers and sisters. And that was the saddest part. It's like, I wish I could have been better for them. Ben Moran, yeah. <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Michael Macy. How Thank are you, brother? I'm good, James. Yeah, it's good Thank to you. see you. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, thanks for it. coming on. You sent me your book away back in August. Yeah, that's Young right, Offender, yeah. powerful book. You've got a very, um, this podcast is we for anyone who's battling with addictions, been in and out of prison, been abused. For you as a kid who was abused when you were younger, heroin addict, alcoholic, done for armed robbery, attempt murder, seen your mum and dad fighting. You've been through turmoil in your life, you've been through misery, you've been through pain, but you've came out the other end of it. First of all, congratulations on being 13 years clean. Thank you, mate. Thank you. It's amazing to see you. You've yeah. got a great glow about you. Um, you're flying, mate, BBC News, everywhere telling your story, going around prisons. This is what it's all about. Change, yeah. how to change and how to make better in life. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, well, you know, I'm good and I'm glad to be here. You know, thanks for having me on, mate. It's a privilege to be here. And, you know, it's it's when I hear you say all that stuff, it's like, crikey, that is my story. You know, in a lot of ways, I'm quite detached from it because I tell it so much. I tell it like it's someone else's story. But that that was me. That I was that kid who grew up in a broken home, who experienced physical abuse, sexual abuse, had an absent father, you know, and um, it's been a, it's been a tough old journey, you know. But I'm here today and, and my life primarily is to help others. That's what I live for, is to help others and carry a message of hope that change is possible, but not just not living a life of crime. I mean, actually being sober, breaking the cycle for your own kids, having a successful business, you know, like really, really changing every aspect of your life and then going and helping others do the same. Yeah, that's the gift in life is given. Try to help yeah. others, try to be better. But when you help somebody else, it's you that it's you really receive something from it. Mm. But it's difficult, like you say, it's about breaking cycles. And you're a prime example that it can be done. Mm. I always go back to the start with my guest brother, where yeah. you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I grew up on a council estate in in a place 
here called Isleworth, which is just outside of um, London. It's very it's, it's 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 a council estate called Ivy Bridge Estate, and if you've ever been to Twickenham Rugby Stadium, you'll see the big tower blocks behind the stadium, and that's where we grew up. You know, I come from um, my mum was from a gypsy background. She left Ireland. She had a prearranged uh, wedding arranged to another rival gypsy family. She fled and came to London. And that's where she met my dad. And my dad was just like a normal guy. He used to like to drink, take drugs, bit of a party guy. And they had a pretty explosive relationship. You know, my mum had, you know, experienced physical abuse from her father. And so she was always looking for that sort of man to protect her, to keep her safe. And she found that in my dad, who was quite an unpredictable, violent man. And, you know, by the time... I was one, we'd moved house three times, he'd left and I was primarily raised by my mum and um, when I was was about five years old, my uncle Tommy came to live with us and my uncle Tommy was different from the rest of my mum's siblings, he was taken to a children's home run by priests who were all paedophiles, he was took into a children's home when he was a baby. So all he'd ever experienced all his life in this children's home in Ireland called called Nazareth Lodge was uh, physical and sexual abuse. When he reached out to my mum and said, I need somewhere to go, my mum welcomed him into our home. And, um, you know, that was, uh, I'd experienced quite a bit of trauma up to that point, but nothing enough to really give up as a young boy. But when, after my Uncle Tommy came to live with us, and after the sexual abuse, that was when I really started changing my attitude and outlook outlook on the world. I basically made a decision as a young boy that this world isn't a friendly place. You know, the people who hurt you the most are normally the ones closest to you. And the people who are closest to you normally lie as well. And as a young five-year-old, it's hard to... Th- to figure your head around that, you know, I had to somehow think, how do I survive this? And my coping strategy as a five-year-old boy was, I'm going to be loud, angry, unpredictable. What that would do, people won't want to be around me, teachers, social workers, anyone. They'll be like, stay away from Michael. He's, he's, got, beha- men- he's got mental problems, behavioral problems, ADHD, whatever you want to call it now, right? That was just my defense of keeping you at arm's length. I knew if I kept you just there, you couldn't hurt me. And so that was my thing through throughout school and 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 you know my early sort of teenage years. And and then I found safety. the The first safety I found was really in in the gang that I became a part of. It, we we weren't called as a gang. We were just a, gang, a group of kids from a council estate. But that was where I first felt a sense like I'm safe. Like there's people here who, who aren't going to hurt me and actually who have my back. The, the The only problem with that, James, is that, you know, we were all young lads from broken homes. So it was like the blind leading the blind. None of us really knew how to live properly as as young men in the world. And we also lived very close to Twickenham Rugby Stadium. Now, sort of, there's like a rugby season throughout the year. And so throughout the year, you'll have a period of time where lots of people will come to Twickenham Rugby Stadium to watch rugby. Now, most rugby fans, and not all of them, but most of them, in my experience, come from wealthy white families. And I grew up on a council estate where it was very mixed culturally, you know, mixed race, black people, Asian people, you know. And and when there was a rugby match on, there'd be loads of Range Rovers, Mercedes, BMWs parked up on the council estate. You'd see rich white families getting out of them, going and watch a rugby. They looked well, they dressed well. And it was always a thing for us where it, it, in a lot of ways, it really shone a light on how little we had you know, financially, but also from a family perspective, you'd see a lot of these young lads going to watch rugby with their dad. For most of us on the council estate, our dads either weren't around it or they were in prison. And so it created this 
alienation of them and us, even though like we we're all from you know near near the same community, it was like, yeah, we're the we're the poor people, and you know, with that come this sort of mentality that in order to get what we want, we have to break the rules, and you know, hustling and committing crime was part of that, and you know, I got I got into crime quite young and. You know, my first offence was uh, armed robbery and possession of firearms. I was age 15. And, um, you know, back then it, was, it, it wasn't it was that heard of, like a 15-year-old armed robber. Um, and, and, and really looking back, it, it was my desire to protect the scared little boy. You know, if I could be the toughest, the loudest criminal it would mean that no one could hurt me. Really, it was about, it was about protecting that little boy, you know? Mm. And so, yeah, that was it. You know, I, I, um, I didn't go to prison for that, for that offense. You know, I went to court and, you know, my solicitor basically presented a case at a judge said, look, look at what, look at what this kid's been through. They had all the case files from everything I'd been through the times I'd been hosp hospitalized. And, um, what were you hospitalized for? When, when I was about, um, was about three, four years old, I, um, I woke up one morning and I went into the kitchen. I didn't have a nappy on. Um, and I went into the kitchen and I sat on the floor and I was in, I was in, I, I'd seen, there was a tin opener on the floor, basically. I was a young boy and I was, um, I was just infatuated with this tin opener, you know, and I was playing with it. And um, and in the middle of this infatuation, I'd wrapped it in my testicles. Um, and that was the first time I was hospitalized as a young boy. You know, I had to be taken to hospital. They had to be surgically removed. Um, so it was like incidents like this that were brought up in court, you know. Um, Can you remember that or do you think somebody done it to you? No, no, I, I, I can't, I can't remember it, but I remembered afterwards, like when there was parties, they would joke about it. They'd be, they, it was like a joke. It was, it was getting laughed at. It was, it was, it's weird because it's, it's something that I, I remember it on some level, you know, and I know when I had sexual partners, when I got older, it was always an area that was. I, I couldn't have someone touch me in that area, basically. So I always knew something had happened there. Um, and I always knew they sort of joked about it when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was always a difficult thing. And, and that was like the thing they, they brought up in court amongst other stuff, but that was some of the yeah. stuff that your mum and dad, they were heroin addicts. My dad was, yeah. Yeah. My mum was an alcoholic. My mum, so, my mum sort of said to my dad, you know, you can't, be around us you know she sort of ended that relationship before i was one because was catholic protestants are reading a book there was a lot that's of right yeah see, that. see my mum come from family of, is uh, it 15 yeah so my dad i've got 15 brothers and sisters from my dad mm -hmm. and my mum come from a gypsy family who was catholic and he and, and he your granddad did he, you used to brand your mum like burn stuff and, and stick it to the kids did I read yeah that? Did yeah I, did I read that in your book? That, that's in the book yeah yeah my my mum had a my mum had a horrific life, you know, um, you know, she grew, she grew up and she looked quite different from the rest of her brothers and sisters. And her dad would always punish her for that, you know, with, uh, with there was never any sexual abuse in, in, in her family, but it was a lot of, it was very physical. Um, and yeah, one of the ways was, was branding them. He'd heat a spoon over the fire and you know, her horrific stuff, James, you know, when I, when my mum told me about it and she told me about it when I was young, I, it traumatized me as a young boy hearing about what my mum had been through and looking at the burns on her, you know? So yeah, she, she had it hard and, you know, it was, um, my mum was doing the best with what she had. She didn't have proper parents to show her how to be a proper mum, you know? So, Although my mum failed in a lot of ways, she actually was done the best as she could with the tools that she was given, you know? So, yeah. 
It can be difficult. Did you have hate for them at a young age, but then once you started to understand them a bit more, more sympathy and love came across, like forgiveness that, as you says there, they, only, they could only be what they knew or what they were taught. So it can be difficult for coming from family who have addiction problems to then follow suit. But then you get a better understanding. Wait a minute, they went through all that shit. It doesn't, for anybody getting sexually abused or physically abused, it doesn't give them a free pass. But mm. when you realise that that's exactly what happened to them, it comes down from a generation mm. to generation. Did you understand your parents more? When did you start to understand that they were fucked up as well? Yeah, well, for me, James, it was much later on. It took me years until I got sober and really unpackaged all of that. Could I really start having any forgiveness for anyone? You know, for years, I was just angry. I was just angry with the world. I was like, if the people you love treat you this way, then what is the average guy on the street going to do to you? So you need to be the loudest, angriest, most unpredictable young man if you're going to survive. Like, I never said that out loud, but that was the messaging I got in my brain. You know, so forgiveness was like so far away from me, you know. It wasn't until years later when I got sober and, I, and you know, I believe I had to make a decision. I don't believe you can be on both sides of the fence. You've either got to be on the side where you're building people up or you're tearing people down. You can't be both. And so, yeah, that was one of the thing. one of the biggest lessons I had to learn was, was, and I found it in finding forgiveness for myself, funny enough, James. You know, when I tried to forgive myself for ever, all the things I'd done and I realized I was innocent, when I come out of my mother's womb, I wasn't a bad person. Then maybe the same goes for my mum yeah. and dad. Maybe they were innocent as well. Mm -hmm. maybe. What age was the first time you went to prison? I was 16 years old. 16 years old. It was it was probably about a month or so after the armed robbery case. And um, it was the same thing again. It was a rugby night in Twickenham. Always a tricky night for us, rugby nights, because loads of loud drunk rugby fans you know getting loud aggressive etc and um and yeah and that and that was a night where it all where the attempted murder happened where gr group of rugby fans got racially abusive to my friend and you know a fight broke out and and it just went too far you know the guy who racially abused my mate got stabbed in the throat the face and the throat like multiple times um and that was it you know we we was all arrested i had the previous armed robbery charge um and they said who you know who done it and you know i went no comment you know i lived by that bullshit code of the street you know snatches get put in ditches yeah just a load of bullshit right <laughs> you know and uh and 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 i kept my mouth shut and i didn't grasp my mate up and he went no comment and so we both went to prison, you know, and I'd done a, done a length of time on remand for him until an eyewitness come forward and said it, the, it wasn't the white kid. The white kid didn't, isn't the one who'd done the stabbing. What was it like being in prison at that age? Was that a wake up call or was that the free pass? I'm a gangster. I'm a, becoming a bad boy where you thought that was a life. People can go to prison and either walk about with a swagger and think it's cool. Yeah. Or other people go, fuck this, I'm never come back here again. Yeah, well, it was funny, James. And I don't, I don't say this to be like egotistical. This was my mindset at the time when we got, when the judge said you're going to fight me offenders, there was a sense of excitement in me. And that was because on my council estate, when any young lad had come out of prison, there was like a party. He was like celebrated like a celebrity. It was like he had loads of street credibility. So in my mind as a young lad, I was like, <clears throat> going to prison is actually a cool thing. You come out, they have a party, girls want to be with you, your street credibility goes up. So in my mind, I was like, great, yeah, let's let's go. Let's, let's get it done. And, you know, that excitement was very short-lived, you know, when, when, you, when you arrive at Felt Young Offenders and you get put in a cell and the door closes. Like that's pretty much it. There's nothing much more to it. You go out and get your food three times a day, but it's 23 hour a day, bang up. And so, you know, I went there with an excitement, but I left with a desire to never go back there because of, you know, what happened whilst I was there. 
What happened? Well, I was, I, you know, back then it was the population, it was about 80% black. And I was a young white kid, a young 16-year-old white kid, you know, with a pretty face, you know. And it was, it, it, I was a target, you know. I looked like a, a, a kid who'd grown up from a very well-to-do family, you know. Although I hadn't, I, I, that's what I looked like. So I had to prove myself. I was constantly trying to prove myself. I looked around and I, I realized, you know, okay, odds are stacked against me. We're outnumbered. The white kids are outnumbered, you know, so you're going to have to work a bit harder to, you know, to not get bullied, you know. And I basically thought I don't have to win. I just have to fight. So it was a bit of a knucklehead mindset, you know, instead of sort of, ducking and diving using my mouth to my advantage I just thought if someone brings it to me I'm gonna respond with aggression but you know it was, it was a wrong strategy and you know I my first fight in there was in the showers you know naively my first time in prison you go into the showers everyone had their boxers on and um I never I never understood why and when I put the shower gel on my on my head and I put the shower gel resting on the shower in front of me, whilst the soap was in my eyes, someone had nicked my shower gel. And then I realized everyone stashed the shower gel down their boxes, right? <laughs> so so that was my that this is my, now this is my first moment. What are you gonna do here, Michael? You take this, they'll probably try and take your food next. So that that's where my first fight happened, you know. I asked where the shower gel was. And no one said nothing, and I resorted to saying, um, so whoever's got my shower gel, go F your mum. And there was a guy on the wing called Pepsi. He was the toughest guy on the wing, a young black lad. They called him Pepsi because he was small and stocky like a can of Pepsi. And, yeah, he he, he come out, what did you effing say about my mum? And we had a fight, and it was just like, luck of the draw you're rolling around in a slippery shower room you know it's like whoever gets the first couple of punches is it's just luck of the draw and I got a few punches on him and after that everyone thought I was this crazy white kid you know when really it was just a lucky I got a lucky few punches on him you know I wasn't I wasn't tough or anything really and um you know I I, I lived off that hype for a little bit but I knew in the back of my head I was like as soon as Pepsi gets an opportunity he's going to get me back and 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 it came one day when I, I I whilst I was in on the attempted murder I had another court case going on for assault on police and um I went to court for that and I didn't get back to prison until really late and the and the the day prison guards knew keep Maisie and Pepsi separated but the prison guard had switched over to the night guard so when I got back, the night guard said, I'm going to put you in the dorm. And on in Feltling Offenders, there's on every wing, there's one dorm, which is a four-man cell. And um, and I was quite excited. I was like, great, put me in the dorm. Yeah, you know, I'll have a bit of new conversation with people to talk to. And, um, and, and I went in the dorm and it was Pepsi and two of his mates. And um, it was it, it was a tough moment. When I, when I walked in, I wanted to straight away make a run for the door again but the governor like slammed the door and he was off so I was caught in the headlights a little bit I was like you know it had been a couple of months since off scrap you know you're not sure if it's still on or not but yeah it was it was still on and you know Pepsi played it cool he waited until lights were out I laid there on my bed for what felt like hours you know trying to reason with myself you know, you're an idiot, don't go to sleep. You just got to stay awake. And in the end, I just give up and I just said, oh, fuck it, I'm just going to try and sleep. And I just, I remember waking up to a pillow over my head. Try to kill you? Yeah, a pillow over my head while the other two were just like battering me, really, you know. Um, and that was like, when I look back at one of the things that made me never want to go back to prison, That it was that moment. It was that moment where... I, I actually thought I was dead. I was like, I'm going to die here in this in this prison cell. They're going to kill me, you know, because it went on and on. You know, no one could hear me screaming. 
you know, the beating just went on and on. And it was only because my cellmate, I was banged up with a guy called Dread. He realised I hadn't come back to the cell and he called the governor and, and you know, other people in the, in the cells were like saying, fucking get him, you know, shouting. So you could hear something was happening. And Dread said, called the governor, he said, has Maisie come back? He said, where'd you put Maisie? Is Maisie in the dorm? He was like, fucking get up there and get Maisie out of there. And that was, if it wasn't for Dread, my cellmate, I reckon I would have died in that cell. Have you ever came across that guy, Pepsi? I've never come across Pepsi, no. I've seen a couple of the lads I was banged up with, but I've never I've never seen Pepsi, no. No, I'd, I mean, it would be, that'd be a tricky one for me, seeing him, you know. Because, um, yeah, that that's, that, that's probably one of the most traumatic events of my life. Yeah. That experience, you know. Were you taking drugs or anything in prison at that time? Not really. The odd bit of weed here and there, if it was someone's birthday <coughs> and uh, some one of their relatives or girlfriends brought in a bit of weed from, but not really. It wasn't like when I was banged up, it's not what it's like now. You know, when I go in the prisons and I do my workshops and and talks in prisons now, it's like everyone's on spice, everyone's on all sorts of drugs. But back then in Feltham, it, it wasn't like you'd get a bit of weed, but you wouldn't be getting heroin and crack and all sorts of all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So what happened when you get out then? So that was it, mate. I, you know, I got out and honestly, James, I had this firm belief, mate. I was like, I'm not going back to prison, mate. That is me. I'm done. I'm never going back there. I, it was like, I'm, I was so convinced in my, I was like, it's, I'm never going back. And the problem was I'd been gone. I'd, I'd, it's probably like five, six months of my life. So I'd, I'd been gone. I had no GCSEs. And, I had a criminal record with armed robbery on it. So it was like any employer, you just got to be honest because they're going to check, right? And so I went for all sorts of jobs. I, I started with jobs that I really wanted. And then I went to jobs that I sort of could tolerate. And then I went to just a job, just any job. To survive. Just any job to survive. And it, and it was just no, no, no. And all the time I'm getting these no's, I've got, older kids from my council estate saying, here you go, Michael, just take this weed and just sell this weed. Like, you ain't got no money. Just take this and give me the money. Because they was all like, no one's going to try and rob you <clears throat> because i got street credibility because I've been to prison. So I'm battling getting no's and I'm getting temptation in this year. Uh, my last chance saloon, the last choice in my head, I thought if everything else fails, I'm going to join the army. I'm going to go to the army and I'm going to say, you know, just uh, just just use me as cannon fodder. Put me on the front line in some war zone, just like a disposable force. I was like, I just don't want to go back to prison. And um, and I went to the careers office in Covent Garden. And yeah, I, 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 just, I was open about my firearms charge and they pretty much like immediately was like, it's not going to happen, mate. It's not when it's not even worth you doing the written exam. Like just, just mate, it's not going to happen. You're you're not going to get into the army with a with, if you've got a, a a charge for firearms. We're not going to give you a loaded firearm. And I tell you, James, that that for me, in that moment, looking back in hindsight, that for me was, you know, like you talk about a crossroad in your life. That for me was like the only way I could go was life of crime now because I tried all these jobs. I'd, I'd even gone for like the most basic jobs and then I tried a cannon fodder unit and got a no there and, and for me it was like, I can't do it. I can't live a legal life and maybe it's just not destined for me. You know, like I grew up with, um, you know, we'd hear like, oh, it's just a gypsy blood. You've got gypsy blood. Life's hard when you're a gypsy, you know? So you sort of had this this sort of ingrained in you that life's meant to be hard. It's meant to be a struggle because you've got gypsy blood running through your veins. And I think in that moment, it was like, maybe it's true. Why should I think I'm any better than all the men who went before me? Maybe I'm just destined to live this life of crime. And that was it. You know, I went back to my council estate. I started, you know, getting into crime, selling drugs, and I was back in prison again, you know, shortly after for, you know, other offences 
and then I come out the second time and the same thing again the second time I didn't even try and get a job mate I was just like it's pointless I just went straight back to crime um, and and then I went back to prison a third time but the, the 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 third time was really sort of where the rock bottom for me happened, the emotional rock bottom, you know, because when I come out of prison the second time, I went to get back into crime and it was sort of around the late 90s and crack and heroin had hit everywhere in London. Everyone was smoking, taking crack and heroin. And a lot of my friends were like, no, you don't, we're not, we're not commit it doing robberies or anything now we're just selling crack and heroin there's so much money in crack and heroin everyone was doing it even like the rich kids would were taking the heroin so he was like um great so i was like i'm that's what i'm gonna do i'm I'm gonna be a dealer but you know i'm a drug addict <laughs> and i got an addictive personality so i was a terrible drug dealer you know i used to just take it all and then have to you know commit crime to pay the guy back now, there, there, there's a good side to that because, you know, my time out of prison ended pretty quickly. I was straight back in, but this time I was back in as a fully blown addict, heroin addict, physically dependent on heroin. And um, that that was when I had my first suicide attempt was in Feltman Offenders when I was, um, when I was put on the hospital wing and I, they, they give me two choice of detox. They give me, it was like a 14 day or longer detox or a really quick one, like a really quick detox. And I, and I was, I thought it wouldn't be that bad. <clears throat> I said, give me the quick one. Let's just get this over with. And um, all I can say, James, for me, you know, it was like hell on earth in in a prison cell. I was in a single cell detoxing from heroin I had visions of stuff in the room I was hot one minute freezing cold the next minute and the thought of suicide floated in my mind and at first I was like don't be so stupid but then as the time went on and we got deeper into the night it started becoming a real you know logical escape from what I was going through. And I'd learned how to do it from another inmate who killed himself. You know, we figured it out. He cut up his bed sheet and he, he ripped up the bed sheet and made it a rope and put it around the bars and and that was it, you know. You know, this moment of, of where I'd given up, where I was like, I, I, I genuinely thought I'd tried to be better than all the men who went before me, my father and everyone. And I just, just like, I tried, I, I couldn't do it. How did you get out of I was, it was just by pure luck, mate. You know, on the hospital wing, um, you know, the prison, the prison officer used to go around throughout the night, like just open the flap on the front of your cell door, just peek in just to check you're still alive because everyone on the hospital wing was detoxing from some sort of drug or or, or they had like uh, mental health problems. Some, Is that some like suicide watch. It was it was like suicide watch, yeah. But also, you know, there's people like probably like I was detoxing from heroin who you know you don't know if they might choke on their sick or they might start being sick and then they choke on it, whatever. And so they come round and just check the flap on your cell, just check you're still alive, basically. And, you know, it was just at that exact moment he decided to do the rounds, you know, the prison officer. Now, if if he had started on the top floor of the wing or on the left-hand side of the wing, I would have been dead or I would have had brain damage because by the time he would have got to me. But he started on the ground floor on the right-hand side. My cell was three doors in. And he come and I was hanging there, I was unconscious and he cut me down. They'd done CPR on me and the next thing I remember is seeing a seeing a bright white light and it was a light on the ceiling of the of the prison cell. You know, and that was it. I was you know, they as soon as I was breathing I showed signs of life, they carried me by my ankles and wrists and put me in a padded cell and that's where I spent the next sort of week to week to 10 days I spent in a padded cell and that for me was where the the 
there was something in me died in that padded cell you know this this desire to be the toughest strongest loudest unpredictable kid died I knew deep down I was a scared little boy who just wanted love you know and 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 it really became apparent to me in that moment James because they called my mum up and said your son almost killed himself you should come and see him and my mum come to visit me and um and I went out to the visiting room which is normally a place where you like to act tough you want to show the outside world I'm running this gaff no one can mess with me all this macho bullshit but I went out broken you know I my neck was all bruised <clears throat> and I sat in front of my mum and and my mum said to me I didn't want to tell you this until I know I was serious about it. But I'm going to AA and I'm a couple of months sober. And I I looked at her in like astonishment. I could see there was something different about her. I thought she was on some new antidepressant or something. And I just broke into tears. Just broke down crying my eyes out in the middle of this visiting room and that for me was a was a clear sign of like I've let go of what everyone else is thinking of me and I just want to get better I just don't want to live this life anymore I don't care what all the other inmates think of me anymore I just don't want to be this person anymore I don't I don't want to live this life anymore yeah, and that's the hard thing about change is when you become at the broken point and you either decide you want to fight or you want to quit and it can be difficult, especially if you're in prison. But if you've got bruises around your neck, if you're seeing your mum trying to change, then you're thinking, I've got two options here. I can go back and, tr and kill myself properly or I fight and mm. make changes to better my life. Because I just think if you had died a few seconds away, you wouldn't have your kids. You wouldn't be with your wife. You wouldn't now be helping others. Mm. What was going through your mind seconds before you knew you were, your life was going to end? Is it a blur or... Do you know what you're doing? Can you remember it? Like, Yeah, I didn't want to die. Do you think it was a... Well, people always say I scream out for help, but if you don't know somebody's coming to save you, then it, you were fully blown going to take your own life. Yeah. Was there the, tears the, or was you numb? The, the prison officer only comes around every two or three hours. Yeah. He's just checking every two or three hours. So the odds of him finding me, and that's why, you know, I'm not a religious man, but I do believe in God. Because there was times like this, I should have died. You know, he could have chosen to start upstairs or on the left side of the wing. I wouldn't be here today. So I do believe, like, all of this had to happen for me to be doing what I'm doing today, you know? Yeah. How long did you have left of your sentence? Well, at that point, I was still on remand, you know, because I went straight to prison as a, as a heroin addict, you know? So I was still on all, I still had all these cases. Was that still YOs? Yes, yeah, still young offenders. Is, all of it is in Felt Young mm -hmm. Offenders, yeah. You know, but it, it's funny. I was I was so desperate to end it, James. I was so de like to the point I was like, I cannot bear this this cold turkey any longer. And as soon as I the rope tightened around my neck, as, like instantly, I didn't want to die. But I'd realised it. It was too late. I couldn't get it off. And it, you go from trying to pull it off. To then realising it's too late. To then thinking about your family. And your mum. And your brothers and sisters. And that was the saddest part. It's like. I wish I could have been better for them. Yeah that's the scary part. I do a lot of suicide work with Chrissy's house. And when people come in with the burn marks and stuff. They get the exact same feeling. And people maybe. I know people have jumped off bridges. And some have survived. The instant they take that step, the thought comes through their mind, I, sh I shouldn't have done this. I yeah. want to survive. Yeah. It must be. I've never been to that side. I've always, I've, suicide's always crossed my mind through life. I think, fuck it, what, would anybody miss me if I was here? But I've not got the balls to follow through with it. But to do that and then have the automatic feeling of saying, I've got something to give. Everybody's got something to give in life. No matter who you are, no matter how fucked up your life is, you have got some. You are here for a purpose. To even be born, it's billions to one. You're already a winner. Mm. 
So it can be difficult to get in these positions where you think the only option is to take your own life. Mm. It must be scary, but then you become numb. Mm. And then to do that, it takes balls. It takes more balls to kill yourself than it does to actually stay here and fight. It takes more courage, I believe. Yeah. But it's scary because the numbers are rising as well through mental health. Was there a lot of people committing suicide in prison at that time when you were there? I... There was one guy who I knew personally who, who committed suicide and that was just through bullying. You know, he was a white kid. He come from a very good family. He went to private school. And unfortunately, if you were a white kid who come from a good family in Felton back then, which was 80% black, you were a target. The odds are you were going to get bullied a lot. And he did and he got bullied and, you know, he, he ended his own life. Now... You know, that's only one that I knew of. But there was lots of other stuff where things, like me being put in the cell with Pepsi, I could have been killed then, you know. And then a few years later, there was a young Asian lad put in a cell with a white racist guy who killed him. And I think it, the prison system at that point was going through this period where there was a huge influx of inmates and not enough staff to deal with it. So... I don't know the statistics on the suicides back then, but I think a lot of deaths could have been prevented back mm -hmm. then. What did your mum say to you when she seen the, the burn marks? Do you know what, James? I can't exactly remember. I think from what I recall, she was really building up to tell me this big news about her being sober. I feel like, you know, she was, it was like a big deal for her. Um, it kind of killed her pride a bit because she's coming with good news but then seeing her son, but she would have partially probably blamed herself also, which yeah. must have been difficult. Yeah. Even though the fuck-ups that families and that happen, like we spoke about earlier, they know. Mm. But sometimes people know, but everybody wants to change. I mean, you're an addict. Every mm. day I was gambling, every day I was taking coke, I was smoking weed. I wanted to quit every single day. Mm. I just never had the courage to say no. Yeah. So it can be difficult. So if your mum's coming with good news and then seeing her son, Partly, she would have probably thought, if I've been the cause of this, I don't know. But yeah. Well, it's funny how things work, James. And this is where I think there's a there's a higher power working in all of this stuff because at exactly the same time I was getting nicked and taken to prison, she was just, you know, on her journey of AA getting sober. So it was like, if she didn't get sober at that point and then come and visit me when I was at my lowest, maybe that, you know, maybe yeah. I might have tried to kill myself again. Mm -hmm. She you was know? coming to you at her strongest. She come to me and the one thing I wanted all my life was just one sober adult to be there for me. Just one sober person I could count on for some solid advice. And when I needed it the most, she showed up to felt me offenders. You know, and, and, and the conversation that day, you know, was after I'd stopped crying we just held hands and it was just, I'd, I'd reverted back to this young boy who just wanted the love from his mum. You know, that's what I became. Yeah, I was like this 17, 18 year old kid, but I was a little boy who wanted his mum's love, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you got out of prison, because you went to AA very early, 18, yeah. 19? Yeah, 18, I went to my first AA meeting, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I went to my first AA meeting, meeting in uh, in Ashford Hospital. They used to have an AA meeting in there. It's not there anymore. Um, and part of me went there because, you know, my mum was, she was newly sober. And you know what it's like when you're newly sober, you want to save everyone, right? So I was like, I don't want to kill my mum's excitement around this. So I'm going to go for my mum. Um and I went to the meeting, it was on a Friday night. I was like, God, what a waste of a Friday night, <laughs> you know, sitting in an AA meeting. But I couldn't deny it. Although these people were a lot older than me, a lot of the stories they were sharing, I could relate to, you know. But I had this strong thing in me that was like, come on, mate, you're 18. <laughs> like, you're not an alcoholic, you know, it, in my mind, an alcoholic is someone who sleeps on a park bench, who wakes up in the morning and the first thing they do is drink. And I was like, I'm not, oh, that's not me. I'm not an alcoholic. And so I was in denial. I was in denial that when I drank, I'd done really stupid stuff. 
And when I drank, I'd end up using drugs. And if I used drugs, I end up doing even more stupid stuff. But I was in denial about it all. You know, it hadn't got bad enough. Despite everything I'd been through, it hadn't got bad enough. And so I thought, I don't need to go to meetings. I don't need to get a sponsor and do the steps. I'm just going to, I'm going to go and try this. I'm going to try and exercise more. I'm going to, I'm going to go and do boxing or like I was, I was searching for all these things to try and fix this problem that didn't mean I'd have to stop drinking, (laughs) you know, like trying different types of alcohol. Like I'm not going to drink spirits. I'm just going to drink beer. I'm not going to drink Stella though. I'm just going to drink Foster's. Actually, I'm not going to drink any beer or spirits. I'm just going to drink Guinness, you know. So trying all these different methods and eventually coming back to the same, you know. It's got the power over you. Yeah, I, I just can't drink like normal people. Yeah, I was the same with the gambling. When you're trying to quit, okay, I'll keep it Try for a Saturday and Sunday. But it never worked, man. It was a 24-7 cycle. Mm. Just constantly trying to get money to get that fixed. Yeah. That's crazy. So when you came out of prison then, is this when you, because it's, it's still a young age to be wanting to work on yourself. Very young age. Yeah. People don't usually, there's usually a point, I say, t- the majority of people I speak to have went to meetings, there's usually about for ages of 28 and 35, there seems to be a massive transition where people kind of awaken and they've got the crossroads where they think, fuck it, I want to change. But for you to be doing that at such a young age shows that how much pressure in your mind, the constant battle, the constant chaos to then, it shows you your character as well to want to do that young and your love for your mother. Yeah. To then want to make the changes, not just for you at the start, like you says, you probably done it for her because that's how much you cared. But then you realise once you started hearing other people's stories, you you probably think, because I used to go to GE meetings and I think, fucking state of these people. Mm. I don't want to be here for 30 years. I look mm. at them and I think, I'm not as bad as him. Look at him. Mm. I was, we're all the same boat. Anything mm. that's got the power over you, you're an addict. Mm. And once you come to that conclusion and realise you, you don't have the power, that's when you truly can heal. Yeah. It's difficult though because as we spoke earlier, I'm constantly bat, yeah. constantly every day. Yeah. No matter how well I'm doing or what I'm doing, it's a, it's, it's a constant good and evil battling up my mind. Mate, I'm the same, you know, and that's the reality of it. You know, you might look at me on Instagram and look at the great life I have, but mate, it's, it's, it's not always a bed of roses for me. I still look in the mirror sometimes and see this little criminal who had a underprivileged background you know i still battle with this voice if i deserve everything i have even though i've worked so hard for it mm-hmm. you know and that's and that's part of it is you know am i willing to really look in the mirror at myself am i willing to stop pointing the finger out and start pointing the finger in and saying are you going to get responsible for your life you know and that for me was the, was the real turning point in my journey on sobriety because I had lots of great excuses James you know, I was sexually abused I, I experienced many cases of neglect my dad left before I was one you know I had lots of reasons to justify why life was so hard and I should drink alcohol and take drugs yeah you know, my life's so hard look at all the shit I've been through and it took someone who was brave enough to say I don't care yeah, all that stuff that happened, it's not okay what happened to you. Oh, are you going to let that ruin the rest of your life? Because in you ruining your life, you're ruining the life of all the people around you who are slowly watching you crumble. What happened when you were in remand? Did you get a sentence? I never got a sentence, no. So I always... Out? Was that the last time you got? Was that the last time you were in prison? All, all my time was on remand. I always spent... <laughs> a lot of time on remand. You know, most of my teenage years, up until when I got out the final time. What age were you? It was just before my 19th birthday. And then how did you leave? What was your transition like then? Because I know 25 was a big turning point as well, was it? 20, 25 20? was when I really threw the towel in. Yeah. That was when I really got sober. So you what know? was the ages of 19 to 25 like for you? Were you still dabbling? Were you still fighting? Oh, mate, it was, it was, it was, it was this thing of like... Can I, tr- can I drink like normal people? Can I have a few pints? You know, I'd look at my other mates who I went to school with, right? Who at that point had got driving license and cars and apprenticeships. And they'd go out on a Friday, they'd have a couple of beers and enjoy themselves, right? And I'd look and think, that's what I want. I want their life. I want to go out on a Friday night, have a couple of beers, wake up Saturday, maybe go and do work. And then Monday morning, I'm right as rain. 
The problem was, I'd go out on a Friday, and if I took cocaine, the party wouldn't stop until Saturday morning. And then Saturday day I'm recovering, and then Saturday night I'm back on it. Probably until Sunday morning, which means Monday I'm hanging. I'm not, I'm not ready to go into work. So then Monday's a sick note. And so you can see, like, over the course of a year, a job isn't going to tolerate that. Your career's not going to go anywhere. And that's what it was from 19 to 25. One step forward, two steps back, one step. And in the end, it was just like, oh my gosh, I'm sick of just scraping along the bottom of life, barely existing. I'm, I'm sick of it. And, and that was it for me. That was when the change happened. You know, when I was like, I need to take accountability for my life. Stop blaming everyone else. And, you know, getting sober was the first step for me. Am I willing to address my alcohol and drug problem and go to meetings and really do the work? You know, get a sponsor, do the steps, start getting accountable, stop blaming everyone. I was great at blaming people. I was great at making excuses. How did your life, how did that, how did it change your mindset from ages like 18 to then getting older and doing the 12 step? How was that feeling for you? Did you feel a much better person? Did you feel more in control of letting go of your demons? Because one of the steps we spoke about earlier in the car is going to meet the people who you've done wrong to. Yeah. How was that? Yeah, for me, James, that was... It was one of the most difficult, but one of the most empowering processes of my life, you know, and what, for the people who don't understand that process, when you join, when you go to AA, it's optional whether you do a, a program called the 12 step program. I chose to do it. I've done it multiple times. And one of the steps of that program is that you go back to the people that you've harmed and you say, sorry. And, you know, for me, James, it was, there were certain people who I harmed who weren't welcoming of my apology they were like if I see you it's on you know don't be mistaken Michael you can take your apology and you know shove it where the sun don't shine but then there was there there was other people who when I said sorry to them they said I always knew you was a good kid Michael but I could see the life you had to go home to and it was moments like that where I realized these were real people I hurt. They had real families. They had real lives. And I came into their life and I committed one crime, one moment of madness. And it had a massive ripple effect for them. And I made a lot of them apologies. And after I'd finished them all, I was like, I'm never going back to that man. I will never go back to the person I used to be. I will never hurt people anymore. And that for me was this sort of moment in my life where I was like, this is what side of the fence I'm going to be on. I'm not going to be on that side where we resort to violence or tear people down. I'm on the side of building people up and being a good person and a law-abiding citizen. And that comes with its own set of problems James being a law abiding citizen you know because you know when I set up my business I set up my business in the middle of the community I grew up in and you know I had lots of scraps with lots of people when I was growing up you know and and when people got released from prison there was conversations that needed to be had and you know on th there was one conversation in particular a young lad got out of prison and 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 he was like, I got, he had a beef with me. And he was like, bruv, you're lucky I don't come and, you know, shoot up your shop and all of this stuff. And I remember he was, he was a, I don't know whether to say it or not, but he was a Muslim lad. There was a mosque not far from, from the, uh, from my shop. Um, I haven't mentioned his name, so he can't sue me, but he, uh, I, and I remember going back and saying, right, what am I going to do? This guy's threatening to shoot up my shop, you know? And my mentor at the time was like, well, you know, what would a law-abiding citizen do? He's like, I was like, well, I guess he'd call the police. And I was like, well, I ain't calling the police. And he was like, well, you better go and just have that conversation with him. So then next time, every Friday, he'd go to the mosque. So I went out and waited outside the mosque and he was there for his mate. I said, listen, come here. 
Well, listen, I don't live by this bullshit code of the street anymore. Let me tell you, San, if you shoot up my shop, I'm going to get you nicked. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to come out here fighting and screaming. I'm not going to try and shoot you back. I'm just going to call the old bill. So don't be making threats like that, because next time you make threats, I'll call the police. And that was like a moment for me of like, okay, that's what a law-abiding citizen would do. You know, that was never an option for me growing up. For me, the police were always the enemy, you know, and that was something I had to unlearn, you know, is that, look, the police have a role and a job and not all of them are bad. You know, in fact, most of them are good, the ones that I've met. So, um, you know, there's, there's stuff like that, James, which, you know, often isn't spoken about in terms of, you know, changing your life, really changing your life. That was one of the biggest things I had to overcome is that actually the police aren't the enemy. Yeah. Is that difficult then to being the bad kid, violent, aggressive to then be then, like I say, I'm going to tell the old bull, I'm not going to fight you with violence. I'm not going to get a gun. But I'm going to tell Robo, how is that then with people calling, oh, he's a little snitch or he's this and he's that? Because then, that, as you say, becoming good becomes a new, different wave that you need to deal with. Whether you're good or bad, you're always going to get hate, mm -hmm. no matter what. So it's how you deal with it, it's how you react. So how did people's reactions then become that, okay, he's a straight pig, he's just, I'm not going to give him any more shit because he'll basically phone the old bill. Yeah, and that's what happened. You know, it's, it's sort of, I know it done the rounds of the of the community I grew up in and most of the people got it already. They was like, look, Michael, Michael, at that time I was like four or five years sober. I had a business, you know, a successful business. I went to work wearing a suit. It's like, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm not that guy you can come and threaten me with shooting up my business. I'm not that person anymore who's going to get a gun out and fight you back. You know, and um, it really cemented for me, that belief in myself is that I'm not that person anymore. I do things differently. You know, I don't just say it. I actually, I actually live it, you know, and these little moments in my life were opportunities to prove, well, how much have you changed, Michael? Really? How, how much have you? Because this is a great opportunity to see. Are you just talking the talk or have you actually changed, Michael? Because you can really prove it here now, you know, by not resorting to your old way of doing things. And that was it for me, you know, and it was, um, you know, but the, the the sort of hate and the gossiping, you know, it, it, it really took off, James, when I got the award. You know, I the, the first thing I'd done when I got sober, and I haven't spoken much about this, but I uh, I would go into prisons and give up my time for free, share my story in prisons. And I'd done it for ever since I got sober, you know, Um and then back in, it would have been 2014, it was one of the local residents nominated me. The Metropolitan Police have this award once a year where they, it's called a Community Safety Hero Award, where they nominate a random person of the community for this award for their acts of kindness and service to the local community. And... um and anyway, I won the award in 2014. I won an award from the Metropolitan Police, right? And that was where the sort of, the, the gossiping really started. Me on the front of the newspaper with the chief superintendent of the Met Police getting an award. You know, everyone was like, oh, there you go. Look, he's definitely yeah, across yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it was because of the, the voluntary work I was doing in, in, mm -hmm. in, in the prisons, you know, which I still do today, but it's, um, this is part of it. You know, when you change your life, we live in a society here in the UK, I'd say it's probably not as bad in the US, but we love to tear people down. We yeah. hate to see people do well. We love to point out their flaws. And I think it needs to stop because if we all came together, you we'd know. be we'd be so stronger, yeah, so we're much stronger. A place, like if you point fingers to people, there's always three. If you point a finger, there's always three pointing back, and it can be difficult. But this is life. Yeah, do you know what I mean, people. That's just life. You just need to learn to deal with it, mm. absorb it, and, yeah. and move on. It's, yeah. um, I think that's why suicide's on the rise as well. I think social media plays a part in that with people um, not feeling good enough, not feeling worthy. Mm people slipping into addictions, depression, especially with the lockdown as well. People don't know what to do. Mm. And I always say it, we're kind of just winging life. 
Yeah. Even doing a podcast, a doc, what, what is it really? Mm. I try to promote a positive message, but I still question everything. Mm. Like, it's crazy that no matter what you do in life, you're thinking, is it right? Is it wrong? It's it's weird the way humans built. We're built for comfort. Mm. We don't like being out of the comfort zone, but that's where the growth is. Mm. When you're put to your tests, when mm. you're backed into a corner, I'm yeah. always backed into a corner, but I always come out swinging, but you just think, what the fuck is it all about, man? Do you know what I mean? See, when you were going through your change, did your relationship with your mum get stronger? Did she stay on the wagon or, or yeah, what happened? Yeah, my mum's my, my great. My mum's almost uh, 20 years sober That's now. That's amazing. Oh, mate, she's an inspiration. Like, we're so close. My mum is, we're like, we're so close now. I tell you, you know, I'm so proud of her, you know, for the life she had to where she is today. But it, 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 was, it was funny because, yeah, in some ways it brought us closer together, but it also pushed us a bit further apart at times. Why was that? It was really the sexual abuse. You know, like I'd kept it a secret all these years because I carried the shame. I was sexually abused by a man. You know, I made it mean all this negative stuff about me. Like I wasn't a real man. There was something wrong with me, you know. So I carried the shame. It was his shame to carry, but I carried it. Like it was, there was something wrong with me. It was my fault. And obviously when you get sober, you can't, you can't bury stuff anymore. You can't use alcohol and drugs to make you forget. So every now and again, I'd be reminded of it. And, you know, my mum didn't know about it and, and neither did any of my family. And, and so it became this sort of thing where... Did they believe you? Not at first, no. I mean, to this day, some of my family are still in denial about it. But but my mum eventually come round to the idea, and 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 you know there's overwhelming evidence. You know he done it to lots of other kids and then was eventually murdered on the streets of Belfast. Um, so eventually it was it, it was all proved to be true. You know, but um, for a long time it caused this divide because you know I didn't want to I didn't want to tell my mum about it. <clears throat> I thought if I tell my mum she might go back out and drink. You know I didn't want that. And I didn't really want to admit it myself. I was like, if I open this can of worms around what happened, am I going to go and drink again? Where am I going to be? Is my head going to be so messed up? I can't go back. And so I tried my best to just forget about it. But the divide between me and my mum got bigger and bigger until I I sat down and I really unpackaged it and, and looked at it. and And really, I realized, James, how much... It was destroying any relationship I had. You know, the problem was is that someone very close to me hurt me and betrayed my trust. So now, as an adult, when people are trying to get close to me and earn my trust, I don't trust them. And I can't let them get close to me because I'm worried, A, you're going to hurt me, or B, you're going to see how messed up I am from all the abuse and you're probably going to run a mile. So I'll reject you first. So at least I've got some power over this situation. So it was affecting any relationship I had. Lots of trust issues. And, you know, it got to a point where I was like, I need to look at this. I really need to look at this. What happened to me as a little boy? And, you know, that for me was um, probably one of the most difficult journeys I went on in sobriety. You know, how do I work through this without using alcohol and drugs as an emotional crutch to get me through? Yeah, it's brave. How did you work through it then for anybody watching who's maybe been abused? Like I say, when people, because I had Barbara O'Hara on, who I always mention, she released a book, The Hospital. Mm -hmm. They used to, doctors used to get the vulnerable kids from broken homes. They had a checklist because yeah. then if they've got the vulnerable kids, if they've got the people who have got kids at addiction, used to take them into psychiatric ward, sign them off as crazy. Some of these kids were running away telling the police the police wouldn't believe them because they were already signed away as crazy so then the police used to take them back for more misery more torture these doctors were killing the kids abusing the kids using um, MQ Ultra and Barbara O'Hare they thought she was a fantasist and it all came out in the wash that it was all true wow. so when you're there thinking I don't want to say anything because I could potentially drink again I could push my mum to the drink again and then if you when you do tell people nobody believes you so it can't be difficult. It's a whole effect of that, but it's very brave. I'm proud of you, brother, for coming forward. And for anybody watching, what advice would you give for them? If it's happened to you, I want you to hear that it's not your fault. 
what happened to you is not your fault. That would be my advice. You know, for years, I thought it was my fault. I thought maybe I was naughty. Maybe I was a bad kid. Maybe I deserved it. Maybe that's why dad left, you know? And that was the hardest thing I had to lift. Because if you believe that you're bad, it's very hard to let anything good in. Compliments, good things in life. So good things in my life would come to me and I would have a desire to tear them down. And I had to realise through a lot of digging deep that it wasn't my fault. I was an innocent little boy. I was an innocent little boy. And I had to remember that innocence. And forgive him. How hard was that to do? It's probably one of the hardest things I've done, James. You know, it wasn't just me. He'd done it to other kids. Most of them I knew. You know. But the anger, it was just eating me up. It was eating me up. I just couldn't carry it anymore. You know, and we done this we done this piece of work. Where I found forgiveness from my uncle was on a with there's an organization called Clear Mind International. Clear Mind run uh self development workshops similar to what we run. Um and we run this workshop on went to this a workshop with them and it was about helping me find forgiveness for myself. Forgiving myself for all the things I'd done wrong. And it traced back to when I came out of my my mother's womb, when I was born, was I a bad kid then? Obviously, you're not a bad kid. I was an innocent little kid, right? Well, maybe my uncle was as well when he come out of his mother's womb. And then life chipped away at him. It, it bit here. It took here. Slowly, slowly chipped away at my uncle until the only way he could cope was by sexually abusing other kids, doing to other kids what was done to him. And so... In finding forgiveness for myself, I found forgiveness for him, you know, and and in that it was then my opportunity to share this message, to give other young men hope who've who suffered this because it's um it's a stigma around it when it's a man abusing a man, you know, and uh, it's not your fault, and uh, the shame is theirs; it's not yours to carry. How was it? How did life progress after you started forgiving? You started letting go, realizing it wasn't your fault. Did you feel a sense of relief, or was the pain st the pain will always still be there? You learn how to accept it. You learn how to move on. But did you to, did you feel better as if something was lifted once you started understanding it wasn't you? There, there, there was a thing, James, that I had right where whenever I met a woman. I was great for three to six months. Then the mask slips. You'd get a version of me, Mr. Better, Perfect. Uh, the version that she wants to see. Yeah, uh, you'd yeah. think, this guy is great, <clears throat> you know? But as soon as you got a little bit too close to me, I started putting walls up. And that was a, that was a reoccurring theme in a lot of my relationships until I met my wife. And and my wife just, you know, I'm so lucky to have met my wife, man. You know, she done a uh, she done a year uh, counselling course, so she had a little bit of knowledge knowledge about her, and she was like in these moments that uh, really feel quite perfect. I feel you cut off. I feel like you want to run. I feel like you don't want to be here, but actually everything is beautiful. And that's what led me to go in and look at the abuse. I was like, this is affecting this now. I'm in my mid-30s. This happened when I was a five-year-old boy and it's still with me. I'm still carrying it. And one of the byproducts of doing this work and finding the forgiveness is I was able to enjoy their moments with my wife. I was able to let her get close to me and not feel afraid, not feel full of fear. How did you drop those barriers? To progress onto the next stages by that six months to understand 
to become completely vulnerable. That's why I believe all my relationships break down because, again, that three months, boom, barriers come up. I find excuses to end them because mm. I'm so and paranoid and insecure of getting hurt and broken because it's a broken heart's the worst kind of thing to go over, one of the worst anyway, mm. because it can mentally scar you for life. Mm. But it's to break down those barriers and be completely vulnerable that it's okay to be hurt. Yeah. It's okay, it happens, it's life. But as men, we don't want to face it. We will pretend. Men are weaker than women, I believe. Mm. Women are the strong ones. They're the ones that breed life. So men, be a man, that's bullshit. Mm. Be a woman. Mm. It's true. <laughs> Not saying cut about in dresses and yeah. whatever, but... Well, if that's uh, what you like, yeah, yeah. it's up to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but for a man, it's difficult because I believe we are so sensitive. Every bad man, I've interviewed some of the baddest men on the planet and you'll see the insecurities and the, the vulnerability with them and it's difficult because we just want to be loved. As you said at the start of the podcast, you just want to be loved. You want mm. a cuddle just to be told everything's going to be okay. Mm. But it is so difficult because we're living in a very fast-paced world. But how did you get through? How did you drop, manage to start dropping those barriers to let your wife in? I brought all of my mess to her. So instead of saying, I'm going to let my walls down and let you in, I just said, okay, look, here is all the mess. Mm -hmm. When you get close to me, this is what I'm battling with. I'm worried you're going to hurt me. I'm worried you're going to reject me. So when we have these lovely moments and you're sitting there completely at peace watching a romantic film eating a box of milk tray yeah i in my head i'm worried don't get too comfortable michael this is all going to turn sour she's probably going to hurt you and once she really sees the real you she's probably going to reject you that's what i'm battling i'm battling all this stuff silently here on my own and when i said that to her she said well that's refreshing to hear because I thought maybe you just weren't attracted to me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in the middle of that, it was like all of me and all of her met for the first time. Connection. And that was the most intimate I'd been in my life. I'd never brought all of myself to a woman mm. ever in my whole life until that moment in, in my mid-30s. You yeah. Know? yeah. Rejection's a massive part on male figures. Abandonment issues, rejection, mm. because we're all scared. We yeah. don't want to feel pain and hurt. Well, mm. we're all hurting at mm. some degree. No matter who you're in life, no matter where you're sitting, no matter if you're sitting in a castle or a tent, we're all hurting. We're mm. all just kind of not sure what the fuck's going on. It's, um, I don't know if it's just me, but there's always a sicky feeling that there's something just not quite right about the planet or what's happening on here. Like, maybe we can brush it up, or oh, you'd get a successful podcast or this or that, but when you break it all down, it doesn't really mean anything okay, you've got a bit of drive and a bit of self-worth, but there's still something within that's not fulfilling enough where it just doesn't feel right. I don't know what it is. That's why I do all the cold water stuff in the mountains because that's when I feel alive. Even mm. doing the podcast, this is where I feel free. Mm. And Paul Gascoigne says it when I had him on a couple of weeks ago that he felt free when he was on the park for 90 minutes. Mm. I feel free when I'm doing this because... Mm. You're not looking at your phone. Your your mindset's not anywhere else. You're in the present moment, mm. connecting. Mm. So it's a it's a beautiful thing that I love to do. Yeah, and mate, I you know, I disagree that it doesn't mean nothing, James. You know, you could probably have any celebrity you want lined up here, but you give people like me a chance to share my story, and I believe there's something in you that wants to give back, that wants to be of service, that wants to help, and that is important. That's what the world needs. We don't need fake celebrities selling all these get well products overnight we need real people with real life experience to give people hope and we don't get that unless people like you open the door so it does mean something yeah i appreciate that and yeah see that's all you need sometimes is hope and i know a lot of people get inspiration every guest no matter who it is will try and promote some sort of positive light and positive message not to make the same mistakes to understand that you're not alone mm. which is very important we're all battling mm. but Life is life, and tomorrow, me and you're up the mountains. We're going to do some cold water stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about the CIP stuff. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I've, I've volunteered in prisons most of my sobriety, 13 years, mm -hmm. you know, and I decided to set up a proper organization, a non profit organization where I can use my skills that I've learned to better my life to help others, you know. So, I go into prisons you know, mainly in the south of England and I deliver, you know, one, two day workshops 
transformational life workshops where I, you know, deliver some of the work that's worked for me. You know, and we run workshops outside of the prisons as well for general members of the public. I run workshops in schools as well. And 90% of it is not for profit. So it's completely voluntary, you know, and it's, it's my way of giving back. You know, that's what I do, you know, and I got to a point in my life where it would have been very easy for me, James. You know, I, I moved to Devon. I bought 10 acres of land. Kids were going to a good school. You know, I had everything. But there was something in me, which I think you've got as well, is I want to be of service. I want to give something back. I want to help. And that's where I really thought, okay, 2018, I set up the CIP project. And CIP stands for Change is Possible, you know, and I think that is, you know, the message that I want to communicate because growing up in my community, there wasn't anyone who'd really turned it around. You had a couple of people who, who might have got had a job, but they still sold weed on the side and they still cheated on their wife, you know, and, and what I really wanted to demonstrate is that actually change is possible. Like you can go from a criminal to a law abiding citizen. You can go from an addict to being sober, you know, like you can go from a broken home to being a, a loyal husband and a loving father. So that's what our work is, you know, it, it's about helping and giving back. So if anyone has heard anything in this podcast and they are struggling, reach out. You know, I'm really active on my messages on, on Instagram. And I know during this lockdown, a lot of men, especially men, are struggling. I get lots of messages. And just talk, just reach out and talk. You know, the, the, the common theme amongst many of the men who've committed suicide is that they felt alone. And I want you to hear out there, whether you're male or female, actually, if you're struggling, you're not alone. You can you can reach out and, and talk and we'll try and help where we can. Yeah, you're one your friends were one of the biggest actors on the planet, Tom Hardy. <laughs> How <laughs> yeah. did that relationship come about? It was just by chance, really, you know. We met, we both, you know, I, I got sober. I I'm from Isleworth and I got sober going to meetings in Richmond and he lives in Richmond and you know, we just met. You know, we met there and, you know, back when we first met, he wasn't, you know, famous. And then, you know, a couple of movies later, suddenly everyone was stopping him for photos and it, it was, you know, incredible really. And Tom for me, and I credit Tom in my book because, you know, in terms of having someone who he's had his own difficulties growing up, he's quite open about that. Um, someone who's who's had difficulties and then literally chased his dreams and smashed it he always stood as this beacon of light for me that if tom can do it then i maybe I, it's possible for me you know so tom for me is always he's just been a beacon of light and always encouraged me to push higher and and been supportive and you know he does a lot behind the scenes for helping people that you know he often doesn't get credited for he's he's a really inspirational bloke you know honored to call him a friend yeah yeah that's amazing that's the kind of people you want surrounded with winners and work ethic but again it's you because you tried acting as well would you think that was like like i says they are doing this podcast is a bit of freedom but when you're doing acting as well do you feel that was a get out as well to be somebody else yeah without a doubt because you, know. you look at tom hardy's parts as well they're very extreme I'd yeah. imagine it'd be very tiring and draining. It's like Daniel Day Lewis, they go deep yeah. into their character, method acting, and method acting. Yeah, it's next level shit. That must play a mental part in life to try. And, we always speak about it, but balance. How did the book um, Young Offender come about? Because that's what two yeah, years, so nearly two years now. Yeah, it's been yeah two years in July. Yeah, it was it was it was. I got the award from the Met Police, and then there was a bit of a media storm around that, and then you know it was. It was really just, you know, Tom actually inspired me to write the book, to be honest with you, really, when it gets to the nitty gritty of it. Lots of people said, write the book. And then one day me and Tom was out canoeing <clears throat> on the River Thames in Richmond. And he was like, you written a book yet, mate? I went, what? I was like, you think I should write this book? And he was like, yeah, mate, I think you should write it. <laughs> and I was like, well, fucking hell. <laughs> If you think I should write it, maybe I should write it. And it was weird, James. You know, like, 
hearing it from someone like Tom was like, maybe I should really pay attention to this. Maybe it is worth writing it. And that's when, you know, the feelers went out and ping, it, I got the, I, I signed with uh, book publishers, a publishing agent, and he pitched it to Penguin and Pan Macmillan. And they both wanted to write it. And we went with Pan Macmillan because they said, you know, it felt like Penguin were going to glamorize it, make it this exciting gangster novel sort of thing. And I was like, I don't want to glamorize that gangster life. There's nothing glamorous about that gangster life. It's, it, it sucks. You yeah, end up in prison. Bullshit, yeah. You know, it's rubbish. You end up in prison. You have a load of mates who claim they're your brothers who never write or visit. <laughs> it's rubbish. And so Pam and said, if, if you go sign with us, we'll do it. We'll tell the truth, the raw, honest truth. So I was like, great. So signed with Pam McMillan and, you know, here we are. It's sold, I think, about 13,000 copies, um, featured in the bestseller chart, you know. And yeah, man, just be, I've been blown away by it, really. You know, whenever someone reads it, I get, you know, a nice message from people. And it's um, it's it's lovely. It's been It's been a lovely experience, you know. There's been a little bit of sort of, you know, negativity. You know, you've had people who have been jealous who want to try and tear you down and stuff like that. That's been the story of, of my rise. Any time I've done something good and succeeded, there's always been people in the way hating, trying to, trying to, you know, tear you down, of assassinate course, your character, yeah, yeah. all sorts of stuff. That you know? happens in life. Every time you level up, that's why it's, it's not just a case of having a talent to succeed. You've also got to have the mindset to understand, to block out the outside noise, to block out the criticism. Everybody's social media, everybody's got an opinion and that's fine, but you just got to keep rising, keep raising the bar and, Success, man, is a beautiful thing when you start achieving it. But when you become successful, you want to be become greedy. So mm. it becomes a fine line. Mm. Don't miss the journey. And always try and remember, enjoy the journey. Always say to Nick, enjoy the journey when we're traveling and we're going to meet guests. Mm. Because I'm constantly thinking. I'm trying to create a story. I'm trying to create entertainment. I'm trying mm. to create so many things to sit across from someone and connect. Mm. Boom, we're on. It's like, I'm plugged in. Let's yeah. go. Bring yeah. the story, what we got. <laughs> how can we help others how can we promote messages how can we change the game it's yeah. constant and it's sometimes it's tiring because mm -hmm. you get drained from it so but now i'm starting to look more after myself mm. mountain climbs cold <laughs> water exposure because i know you're a fan of wim hof who i've had on the podcast yeah we nice man massive fan of wim you know i done a i done a one of his training workshops mm. with him back in uh i think it was 2018 or 2017 so I've met Wim. I've done one of some Not of his case, training. Great guy. Mate, he's yeah. just like you, I've yeah. never met anyone like him. Yeah. He is just like he's got just, a vibe, isn't he? He's, he's got, got an aura. such a yeah. vibe, mate. You mm. just you feel light and yeah. like mm -hmm. energized around him. But yeah, he's he's an incredible guy, you know. And I think just to come back on the point you made about doing all this stuff is like someone once said to me, you know, with this, this work that you do out in the public eye, trying to share a positive message, you often don't see where the ripple effect ends. You know, like you invite me on and someone reaches out to me and I support them and they get sober and now their wife has got a sober husband, their children have got a sober dad. You know, where does that ripple effect end? You know, like, yeah. and I think that's one thing I always hold on to in the middle of all this. Yeah, we're busy, we're doing a lot, but you're causing lots of ripples, positive ripples in the lives of other people just by, you know, giving people like me a platform here and then me sharing my story openly and honestly, not glamorizing yeah. anything, telling it how it is, you know? Yeah, and that's the, the best thing. Like, we never glamorize anybody, but it's still good to understand. It's good to laugh as well because we spoke about like Jordan Peterson, psychologist, and he had the nervous breakdown. Sometimes we can just search too much and just forget to drop everything and just laugh. Yeah. Just laugh, man. Just yeah. life's for living as well. Like, don't take things too seriously. Become honest with yourself. Life can be beautiful. Mm. It can be good. There will be battles. There will be struggles. Happiness is not a 24-7 thing. That is an illusion. You yeah. can't be happy 24-7 because there's always issues. Bills, kids. Yeah. Where are you going to get food from? How are you going to play? How are you going to do next week? And your we're life? not built that way. Yeah, we want both for comfort. No, we're human beings. Yeah. And human beings have a full range of human emotions. Mm hmm so we're not meant to be happy all the time. You're meant to f experience all these emotions. And the key for me is like, okay, can I experience all my emotions in all their levels of intensity and not use alcohol and drugs to numb them out? And that has been the key and the art of my 
how in living how learning how to live a sober life yeah i watched one of your videos michael there's a thing that you do with your wife you used to do it quite frequently at the start i think it was maybe every night or every second night you'd switch everything off look in each other's eyes have a discussion what's the benefits of this yeah so for me that's how we really connect learn the art of intimacy Mm -hmm. You know, intimacy for me growing up was sex. Yeah, it's shagging. Right? I was like, that's intimacy, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And it's not, <laughs> right? Intimacy, if you break the word down, is into me see. So I'm going to let you see into me. Now, how do we do that? We have to turn off all distractions. So, you know, I turn the phones off, TV off, radio off, any distraction off. We set a timer on our phone. Our, whilst our phone is on airplane mode, we set a 10 minute timer. Boom, you're on. <laughs> my, <laughs> my wife yeah. goes 10 minutes and all I do is listen. And when she's finished, I don't, we start a timer and I go, but I don't jump in responding to everything she said. Like, listen, when you said about the dishes, blah, 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 blah. We just check in. How are you doing? How are you feeling? And we use I statements. So anything that starts with you, just scrap it. I statements. So always start the sentence with I. And, you know, slowly you start to remember the person you fell in love with. You know, I'd forgot, James. You know, like I, I, met, I met my wife. I knew the moment I met her, I'd marry her. I fell in love with her straight away. Beautiful heart, kind spirit. And I, and I, and I got sober. And I, and I set up a business and I do voluntary work in prisons. And slowly, slowly, we stop talking, we stop communicating and we start disconnecting. And, you know, people who I talk to who their relationships break down, I believe is because you stop doing that sort of stuff is connecting. Like you forget the person you fell in love with. And that process for us, another process which are, which was given to us from Clearmind International, Dwayne and Catherine O'Kane, who are experts in the field of relationships. I, I believe if you're having any relationship problems, seek out Dwayne and Catherine O'Kane from Clearmind. And they pass that on to us. Have a check-in. It's so simple. Eye contact and talking, you know, and it saved our relationship, you know. It was... Um, it's something that we go back to. I'll be honest, it's difficult now. You've got, you got two kids and a newborn, right? It's tough to get no distractions, but yeah. occasionally we do. And, and you know, we remember, you know, I see you. Yeah, yeah. I see you. You're the girl I fell yeah. in love with all them years ago. It's good though, because as much as we can talk all this stuff, like I've educated myself so much over the last six years and reading books and audio books and doing everything, trying to become a better person, but it's still difficult. Like, it's hard to take your own advice. Mm. Like somebody can come into my life who's maybe depressed and down, addiction problems. I can help change their their mind. Not I can, don't help them change instantly, but I can plant the seeds where they start seeing the world differently. Mm. I know this, but sometimes I can have my down days and I don't put it into practice myself, yeah. which I kick because I'm going, you know this, so stop talking shit and get it done because it's hard to make any sort of changes Yeah. because the subconscious mind will just take control again. 95% of our day is controlled with our subconscious. Cool. So it's to do change. It is difficult, but it can be done. Your prime example, it can be done. I'm prime example, it can mm. be done. Sometimes we can be very much our worst own cr critics. Yeah, of course. Just looking for flaws and flaws because we're always wanting to improve. Mm. So in, yeah, you do your own podcast and interviews and stuff as well. How can people get in? And yeah, Michael, yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've got I've got a podcast. It's called the CIP podcast. Mm -hmm. CIP, obviously, same as this. Change is possible. So I try and find guests who've you know overcome a big change in their life. Um, and yeah, I'm on Instagram and and Facebook. What's your name? Just Michael Macy. Just Michael Macy. Yeah, it's just my name. We'll leave all the links in the description. Where can people get your book? You can get the book on uh, Amazon, Waterstones. I think any any of the retailers. Amazon is probably the, in my experience, the most best value for money um so amazon yeah and i think i, I brought some free copies yeah for you james uh -huh. so distribute them yeah, as you no, like we'll do, we'll do photos we'll do um something on twitter for retweets to been for a chance to win the books and stuff great um for anybody that's watching and the struggle right now what advice would you give for them reach out reach out and talk we're at a period of time through lockdowns where the government has forced us to isolate the opposite of isolation is connection. 
we also live in a time where social media and Zoom and other platforms make connection possible from our living rooms. So reach out, talk. You know, if, if you're struggling, don't struggle alone. Reach out to myself or any of the guys who, who work with the CIP project because, um, you know, we're a group of men. We're not gurus. We're not saints. We don't have all the answers. We've just found a new way to live and, you know, we can help. So, Because I'm going to come to one of your retreats. What kind of stuff is it we do here? We do, so, you know, I trained in breath work. So we do breath work. We do Native American sweat lodge. We do cold water therapy. We do shadow work. We do processing. Um, there's lots of stuff, lots of, lots of powerful stuff that will help you really be the person that you want to be. So you're digging deep, everything's within, everything's natural. Yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? I think just thank you, James. You know, thanks for giving me this opportunity and, you know, yeah, I'm grateful for it. Keep Ma doing what you're doing. Michael, absolute honour, brother. Thank you, You're mate. a good man. And the same. Can't wait to see what you do for the rest of the future, brother. Nice one, God mate. bless. God bless, mate. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.